we haven't really heard like your story. So we're talking about your kids. Where did you inherit like your beliefs? When did you get into like all the politics, all that? So like, yeah, when did you start making content? Yeah, content. Yeah. Uh, so I've been making content. I'm 38 now. I started making content content when I was 17, maybe. So I, I was a, on, over on like years. what platform? Uh, so my. Uh, so I grew up in Burbank, California. My mom was a Hollywood executive. She worked on reality TV. My dad was a composer. Uh, were, and were they I, religious? Uh, Sorry to cut you they, off. Originally, no. So they were they were kind of quasi interested in religion. They only became fully orthodox when I was eleven. Okay. So I remember eating a KFC and McDonald's, for example. Yeah. Uh, and uh, you know, not bad, not bad. Mm-hmm. I will say. <laughs> <laughs> but it was uh, it, when when we were eleven. That's when the family became fully orthodox. I'd gone to public school until I was about eight or nine. And then I went to private school for a couple of years. Then I went back to public school for, for part of middle school. Then I was in private school, Jewish day school, uh, for, uh, for, for high school. And I skipped during that process third grade and ninth grade. So I, f- I finished high school when I was 16 and went to UCLA. And, um, and when I went to UCLA, I thought that I was actually going to ma- double major in music and genetic science. Uh, that's, that's what I was interested in at the time. I was a, a concert level violinist at the time also. I'd started playing when I was five. Uh, and so I had... You know, you, you have to make a choice at a certain point when you're 15, 16 years old, if you're going to go for it, like try to be the concert level violinist, you have to be practicing six to eight hours a day. And so do you want to basically make that your life or do you want to go do something else? My dad, who is a musician and my mom, who was married to a musician, was like, this is a bad idea. You're going to go get a job. Uh, you're going to you're going to go on a career path that doesn't end with with you, you know, playing in uh, playing in a bar somewhere. Uh, and so uh, <laughs> I, I end up going to UCLA. Uh, I wanted to go to uh, to Johns Hopkins, actually. And my parents were like, you're 16, you're not going anywhere. So I lived at home while I was in college. So I stepped on campus and very quickly, I, I, I saw, you know, kind of how left, I, I never really thought of myself as, as super political. I mean, I knew I was political. And I was interested in politics. I liked history. I liked talking about political issues and current events. Um, but it was really on campus that I was kind of faced with an alternative point of view that I, that I really want to speak about. And so the, one of the first things that happened is I walked on campus, I picked up the UCLA student newspaper, the Daily Bruin, and there was an editor, there was an editorial comparing the then prime minister of Israel, Ariel Sharon, this is, this is 2001, uh, to Adolf Eichmann, as in like the facilitator of the Holocaust. And, uh, and so I walked into the Daily Bruin offices and I said, can I write a counter to this? I would have been 16 at the time. Uh, I said, can I write a counter to this? And they're like, yeah, sure. Write a counter. So I wrote a counter. And then a couple of weeks later, they came to me and they said, we have a, a perspective column from somebody and you're the only person who's on the right that we've ever heard of. And so can you write the countervailing point of view? So that turned into every couple of weeks, we would do like a point counterpoint column in the Daily Bruin. And then I applied for and got a kind of regular columnist position, just writing my own column at the Daily Bruin as the token conservative on the paper. It was very well read. And then after doing that for maybe a year, so I was 17, I turned to my dad and I said, you know, you've been reading my stuff. Do you think my stuff is good enough to go in a real paper, not just a college paper? And he said, yeah, actually I do. Let me do some research. So he looked up online a syndicator, like who, who puts, who places columns in papers. And so the place he came up with was Creator Syndicate. Creator Syndicate was the syndicator at the time of people on the left, like Molly Ivins and people on the right, like David Limbaugh. Um, Michelle Malkin was big at, at, at Creators at the time. And, um, and so uh, he, my, my dad gave me their address and there was sort of a form that you could just send in your columns. So I sent in my columns cold and about three weeks later they called and they didn't know really how old I was. Uh, and so they said, we want you to write, well, they knew I was young. They didn't know how young I was. They said, we want you to write a weekly column for us. Uh, so I was, they were going to syndicate the column, which means they were going to put it in a bunch of different papers, uh, at, at one time. So you know, 10, 12. Now I think it runs in maybe 150 or 200 papers every week. Uh, so I've been writing a syndicated column since I was 17 years old. Wow. Um, and, uh, pretty much everything dumb. I don't say everything. I say dumb stuff fairly routinely, but most of the dumb stuff that I've said was between the age in that column, between the ages of maybe 17 and 24, which is why I say like people make bad decisions at that time. You have more radical viewpoints when you're younger, you tend to moderate mm-hmm. a little bit, at least be, I wouldn't say moderate as much as become more realistic about the world as you get older. Um, but yes, yeah, so I was writing a syndicated column when I was, when I was 17, my first book came out when I was 20 about uh, left-wing bias on college campuses called Brainwash that came out in 2003, 2000, 2003, 2004. Uh, and then I went to, uh, I ended up going to Harvard Law School. I wrote another couple of books while I was at Harvard Law. Uh, I came out of Harvard Law when I was 23. And, um, and then I actually thought I was just going to go into law practice. I worked at a, a law firm called Goodwin Proctor, which was a major law firm, uh, corporate law firm in the real estate market 
uh, there was only one problem. I joined a real estate law firm in 2007, which is the worst time in human history to join a real estate law firm. Yeah. Uh, so the, the market absolutely tanks. I'm sitting in a beautiful office overlooking you know, Century City and then all the way down to the ocean and doing nothing all day long. Uh, and I couldn't stand it. I couldn't bear it. I hated it. Also, if you're a first year associate at a law firm, you basically sit there all day and you just read page numbers. It's like, is this paragraph properly formatted? You have to read for typos. Is the comma in the right place? I'm not that detail oriented. In fact, I'm so not detail oriented that my assistant has to like text me to take out the garbage. I just delegate everything. So <laughs> this is like the worst job in history for me. So about eight months in, uh, I, I turned to, I'd, I'd met my wife when I came back to, to Los Angeles. She was at UCLA at the time. She was a junior at, at UCLA. And we had been dating for, we, we dated for like two and a half months before we got engaged. Uh, and so we were already engaged at this point. Two and, and a half months? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. It was, uh, you know, we, you see what you like, move yeah. fast, right? Take it off the market. I like it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that it, is smart. I listen, I, I, I encourage it. I think that the people dating for five, six years at a time, if you can't make your mind up within year one, I think that you probably need to move on. Um, I think people people date for too long. They tend to talk themselves into long. You're gonna get us in trouble here, yeah, now, bro. bro. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, they, listen. The first, whenever whenever I meet you know people who are say how long have you been dating, they'll say two years. I'm like, so what are you waiting for? Either get married or get off the pot. You know, like <laughs> that is true. Like people they, are scared of commitment, though, right? Yeah, then you're, it's a lifelong thing after that. For sure, but you shouldn't. But my view is is different when it comes to dating than everybody else's, right? Because I was always dating for marriage. So my father had always said, and I think he's right, that the, you only meet the person you're going to marry when you already believe that it's time to get married. People tend to meet a person, date a person, they're like, oh, I'll fall into marriage. I'll, I'll just, I'll sort of, I'll fall in love with them and then I'll, and then I'll decide to get married. Wrong. You decide you're going to get married, then you meet the person you can fall in love with because you're thinking in a different way. When you're, when you're dating for marriage, you have a set of values. Hmm. that are that are in your head. What do you want your life to look like? How do you want your life to be structured? What do you want to teach your kids? What kind of community? Like these are really important questions because you know, Jonathan Haidt, the, uh, the psychologist, social psychologist, he, he talks about you know, sort of the trajectory of relationships and love. And what he says is that at the very beginning, this is true for every relationship, at the very beginning, there's a lot of passionate love and very low levels of what he calls companionate love. Companionate love is sort of like trust and knowledge of the other person. You don't know the other person. How could you? Passionate love is like, I want to be with them all the time. A lot of sexual attraction here. We got like the sparks are flying. And in every relationship, after a couple of years, you start to see a decline in the passionate love and an increase in the companionate love, which is why you'll see couples who are 70 years old. And it's not like they're, you know, going at it 24 hours a day. It's more like they feel like they're integrated with one another. It's almost like one unit. Uh, and so when you're dating for marriage, you're, yes, the passionate love will be there, but you're also trying to look beyond what that two-year passionate love period is going to look like to what is the rest of your life going to look like. And that sets up a whole different expectation of the person you're dating and, and for yourself, right? Why are you actually in the room with this person? Is it because they're good looking and because they're sexy or is it, or is it because this is a person you actually want to spend serious amounts of time with and maybe commit to? Yeah. And so that, that sets up like my first date with my wife was like a three hour date where we walked and we went to Coffee Bean on in Santa Monica. And then we walked on the beach. This is before it was taken over by drug addicts and, and the mentally <laughs> ill. Uh, and we uh, we walked for three hours on the on the beach talking about like free will and determinism uh, and religion. And Dude, so, I mean, kind of stem my relationships have never gone that deep. I have not analyzed anything like that. So. Yeah, well, I mean, the, I think I need to. Yeah, you have to first decide whether you think it's time in your life to to get serious about marriage, and if it is, then you have to ask. You'll those need questions. like a whole three hour session with Ben after this <laughs> just on that topic. So yeah, yeah so sure. we, anyway, we were, we were to get back to the story. We were we were dating for uh, two and a half months before we got engaged, uh, and uh, that was pretty funny actually. Like uh, maybe two months in, actually. So our first date was September fifth, and we got engaged December twenty second. Was so, she so, at all surprised? So three and a half months. Uh, well, she, she was not surprised when we got engaged. She, well, what was really funny is that, so a couple of things happened. One, about mid-November, November 15th, I remember all the dates. Uh, November 15th, uh, I, it was the first time I said, I love you to my wife. And she said, thank you. And I was like, oh, <laughs> oh shit. Uh, yeah. So that was, and, and that lasted for about a month. That was a very awkward month. It was like, I'd finish every phone call. I'd be like, love you, sweetheart. Thanks. Bye. So that was real awkward. And, uh, and then, uh, but the, re the reason she was doing that, and it made sense, is because of what happened next, right? December 15th, she says to me, I, I love you too. And I said, and she knew what was going to happen. She said that and the next words out of my mouth were, okay, let's get married. Like, we're done. Okay. And she's like, I love you. You love me. We're done. Let's get married. Let's have kids. Let's have a, have a life together. And she goes, let's just enjoy this time. So I'm not enjoying this time. This is miserable for me. Like, what, what are you talking about? There's nothing for, there's nothing for, if you're a religious person dating for marriage, the worst thing is, is the dating. They, like the dating and the engagement sucks. Then you actually get to 
get married. Like if you're a religious person, then you get to get married, you get to sleep with the person, you get to live with the person, build a life. But like that's all the rest of this is just delay. So she's like, why don't we enjoy this? I'm like, you don't understand. You don't, I'm not enjoying this at all. This sucks. Like I want to lock this down. We'll be done. It'll be great. This will be over this period of our life. And so uh, she was like, well, you know, let's, let's just think about it. A week later, we got engaged. Uh, so it took her about a week to adjust. And that was because she was 20 at the time. And so she was afraid of telling her parents, like they didn't expect her to get married that fast. Sure. Uh, and so she was afraid of, of telling her parents at the time that, uh, that she was engaged or that she was going to get engaged. And she was afraid of what people would say and all this kind of stuff. And actually the most romantic thing she ever said to me, uh, I, I, I was talking to her and it was a, it was a Shabbat. It was a Saturday and I was staying over at this kind of co-op that she, she lived at. And we were talking and, uh, and I was saying to her, like, this is, is there a reason why we shouldn't get married, really? And she was like, well, and she, she finally realized that the reason that she was holding off is because she was, uh, she was afraid of what other people were going to say and how other people were going to judge her for it. And so she turned to me and she said, people are so full of shit. And then we got engaged. 